evening to talk to you about one of England's most unsuccessful kings, uh, Edward II. Uh, if you've seen the film Braveheart, you remember Braveheart about 20 years ago with Mel Gibson? Uh, then if you've seen this film, then you've seen Edward II. Uh, he's the, the gay prince whose lover is thrown out of the window uh, by his father. Uh, but this, fortunately, is uh, wildly inaccurate. Uh, so I'm here this evening to talk to you uh, about the real Edward II. So my biography of him is called The Unconventional King, uh, because that is exactly what Edward was. Uh, in many ways, he was hundred years, hundreds of years ahead of his time. Uh, he was a king with the common touch, who very much enjoyed the company of his low-born subjects and took part in their activities, uh, such as digging ditches, uh, satching moves and so on. Uh, he loved outdoor exercise and he was, as many of you will perhaps know, uh, he was openly a lover of men. This is perhaps what he's most famous for. Uh, contrary to the depiction of him in Braveheart, uh, he was an enormously strong and physically powerful man. Um, he was probably at least six feet tall uh, contemporary chroniclers uh, all comment on his enormous strength. Uh, physically, he was one of the strongest men in the kingdom, says one chronicler. Uh, so the portrayal you see of him in Braveheart is inaccurate, and perhaps we could even call it homophobic. <laughs> so Edward II was born on the 25th of April, 1284, so 732 years ago. He was born in Carnarvon, in the town of North, the town of Carnarvon in North Wales, uh, because his father had just conquered North Wales, uh, so Edward was born there. Uh, perhaps some of you have visited or seen photos of the great Carnarvon Castle, which still stands in the town today. Uh, this was built by Edward's father, probably beginning around the time he was born. Uh, so it's possible that Edward was born in the middle of a, busy, of a muddy building site, which can't have been very comfortable for his poor mother. Uh, in his own lifetime and ever since, he's often known as Edward of Carnarvon, uh, after his birthplace. He was the first of three English kings who was born in Wales. Uh, the others were Henry V and Henry VII. And he is one of only two English monarchs who had a Spanish mother, uh, the second was uh, Mary Tudor, Queen Mary I, the daughter of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. Edward II, or Edward of Carnarvon, was born in the 12th year of his father's reign as King of England, 1284. Uh, so his father was King Edward I, uh, who in April 1284 was almost 45 years old. Uh, he was born in June 1239 as the eldest child of King Henry III. So nowadays, of course, Edward is a very common name almost everywhere in Europe. Uh, but when Edward I was born in 1239, uh, the name had become extremely archaic in England. Uh, Edward is an old English name, and it fell out of use uh, after the Norman conquest of England in 1066. Uh, so by 1239, it had become as strange as calling your son Wolfnoth or Athelstan. Uh, but Henry III, who was Edward I's father and Edward II's grandfather, was a big fan of Edward the Confessor, who was the King of England, who died in 1066, and who was canonised as a saint uh, a century after his death. And therefore he named his eldest son uh, in honour of Edward the Confessor, and thus uh, Edward became an extremely common name all over Europe. So uh, when Edward I, Edward II's father, became King of England, when his father Henry III died in November 1272, uh, he was on crusade in the Holy Land and did not return to England until almost two years later. Uh, he was accompanied on crusade uh, by his wife, uh, Edward II's mother, uh, his Spanish mother, uh, who was known in her own lifetime as Doña Leonor de Castilla, in modern English, we call her Eleanor of Castile. Uh, she was the 12th of 15 children of a great Spanish king called Fernando III, the king of Castile and Leon. In the Middle Ages, Spain was divided into, into four kingdoms, and Fernando ruled two of these kingdoms. He inherited Castile from his mother and Leon from his father. <coughs> 
Fernando was a great warrior king uh, who captured most of Andalusia uh, from its Muslim rulers, uh, the Almohad dynasty. Uh, you may be aware that much of Spain was under Muslim control for more than 500 years, and Fernando III played a very important role in recapturing uh, a large part of Andalusia, re-Christianizing it. Uh, this is a period of Spanish history called the Reconquista, the Reconquest. And Fernando III was canonized as a saint of the Catholic Church in 1671, uh, more than 400 years after his death. Uh, so <coughs> he's also the patron saint of the city of Seville, uh, which he captured from the Almohad dynasty in 1248. So if you visited Andalusia in Seville, then uh, Edward II's grandfather is the patron saint of that city. So uh, Edward II's parents, Edward and Leonor, married in Spain. Uh, they got married in Burgos in northern Spain in November 1254. So Edward, the future King Edward I, was 15 at this time, and Leonor was probably 13, or almost uh, shortly to, to turn 13. And over the next 30 years, they had many children together, uh, at least 14 and perhaps as many as 16. Edward II, remarkably, was the youngest of these many children. So he had three older brothers and at least ten older sisters, perhaps even more. Uh, but by the time he was born, uh, uh, only five of his older sisters were still alive. So only six of these 14 or 16 children outlived their mother and only four of them outlived their father. And even in an age of high infant mortality, this, this is a, a very high number of children uh, to die. So when Edward of Carnarvon was born in April 1284, uh, he was not born as heir to the throne because one of his older brothers was still alive. Uh, this boy was called Alfonso. He was named after his uncle and godfather, King Alfonso X of Castile, uh, Eleanor of Castile's eldest brother. And Alfonso was born in Bayonne, uh, which is a town in the southwest of France, not far from the Spanish border. And perhaps you're aware that in the Middle Ages, the kings of England owned a large territory in France. Uh, they were, as well as being the kings of England, they were also the Dukes of Aquitaine. And so Alfonso was born in his father's duchy of Aquitaine, and for 10 years he was the heir to the English throne. So for 10 years, the English grew used to the fact that one day they would have a king, Alfonso, ruling over them. <laughs> and then suddenly at the age of 10, in August 1284, Alfonso died and sadly deprived England of its king, Alfonso. And his younger brother, Edward of Carnarvon, who was then only four months old, uh, became heir to the English throne. Um, Edward, so Edward was born in Wales, but he left when he was only a baby, and he didn't return again until he was 17 in 1301, when he was made Prince of Wales. Uh, so originally the Princes of Wales were the rulers of Wales, uh, but since Edward II, the heirs to the English throne have always, almost always been uh, the Princes of Wales. So Edward was only six years old when he lost his Spanish mother, uh, Eleanor of Castile. She was in her late 40s when she died in November 1290. Uh, she died in a town called Harby in Nottinghamshire, uh, in, in the English Midlands. And her grieving widower, King Edward I, uh, erected a number of statues in her honor at every place where her funeral cortege rested on its way from Nottinghamshire to Westminster Abbey. They're called the Eleanor, the Eleanor Crosses. I see some of you nodding. Yeah. I think, yes, you know them, or perhaps you've seen them. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I think two or three of them are still exist. One was Charing Cross. Charing Cross is one of them, yes, yeah, no. right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and so Edward uh, of Carnarvon, at six years old, inherited some land from his mother. And rather remarkably, this land was in France. So although Eleanor of Castile was Spanish, uh, her mother was French. And she had inherited a county called Pontieu from her mother, which passed to Edward of Carnarvon. Uh, Pontieu no longer exists on the political map of France, but it's ne basically next to Normandy, uh, around the Somme River in northern France. So we have this rather interesting situation <laughs> that a king of England, born in Wales, inherited land in France from his Spanish mother. 
So Edward became the counterpoint here. Uh, later in life, he also became the Duke of Aquitaine in southwest France, which he inherited from his father and ultimately from his great great grandmother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, the Queen of England. Uh, he was also Prince of Wales and he was the Lord of Ireland. So he had quite a lot of titles and quite a lot of territory. So his father, King Edward I, remained a widower for nine years and then in 1299 married his second wife, uh, Edward II's stepmother. Uh, Edward I was already 60 when he married for the second time. Uh, his wife was only 20. Uh, she was Marguerite or Margaret of France. Uh, she was the half-sister of the very powerful King Philip IV of France. And she was the mother of Edward II's two half-brothers, uh, Thomas and Edmund, uh, who were 16 and 17 years younger than he was. Thomas was the Earl of Norfolk and Edmund was the Earl of Kent. So although uh, Edward became the heir to the throne at four months old and therefore was, of course, an extremely important person, uh, we don't really know a great deal about his childhood or his upbringing. Uh, he was betrothed three times in childhood uh, to girls uh, like the King of France's sister, uh, the Count of Flanders' daughter, uh, so basically just to, to further English foreign policy at the time. Uh, he grew up mostly at a place called King's Langley, which is in the English county of Hertfordshire, uh, near St. Albans. It's not far from London. Uh, this became his favourite residence later in life. And this is probably where he learned to take part in activities such as driving carts and thatching roofs and digging ditches and <coughs> other kind of rather unconventional things that he did. Uh, so although we might be sympathetic towards uh, any people who want to do these like, outdoor activities, uh, Edward's contemporaries uh, were, were not so keen, and he attracted a lot of criticism for this uh, from contemporary chroniclers, and even from the Pope, uh, because of course in, in the Middle Ages, hierarchy was very rigid, there were very fixed strata of society, and if you were the king and the son of the king, you were not meant to dig ditches and sack food. So Edward got an awful lot of criticism for this in his own way. So his father, King Edward I, uh, died on the 7th of July, 1307, uh, at the age of 68. And he died in a remote corner of England, uh, near Carlisle, in the far northwest of England, because he was going on yet another military campaign to Scotland. So just to go back in time a little bit, and to cut a very long story short, uh, Edward I's brother-in-law, Alexander III of Scotland, died in 1286, and he left as his only heir his granddaughter Margaret, who is known to history as the Maid of Norway. She was the daughter of King Eric II of Norway, and her mother was Alexander III of Scotland's daughter. And so she became the rightful Queen of Scotland in her own right, and her engagement to Edward of Carnarvon was arranged. Uh, but sadly, this little girl died in 1290 at the age of only seven. Uh, and this th then prevented any unification of England and Scotland as early as, as 1290, and the, the countries remained basically enemies for the next few centuries. Uh, there was a long period of an interregnum uh, in Scotland, uh, until 1306, when Robert Bruce, uh, the great Robert Bruce, who you've probably all heard of, one of the greatest kings of Scotland, uh, he killed his greatest rival, John Comyn. Uh, he stabbed him to death in the church in Dumfries and basically had himself crowned King of Scotland. And Edward I was not happy about this, so uh, went to Scotland on military campaigns uh, against Robert Bruce. So basically, Edward II inherited from his father this unwinnable war in Scotland uh, because Robert the Bruce was a, was a great king and Edward II wasn't. Uh, and he did not have the ability uh, to conquer Scotland, to defeat Robert Bruce, and this would overshadow much of his reign. Uh, Edward I also left his son uh, enormous debts in 1307, something like £200,000, uh, with 700 years of inflation, that's billions, mm -hmm. uncountable billions that he was left in, in debt. So he was left with a very difficult legacy. Probably the very first thing that Edward II did when he became king uh, in July 1307 uh, was to recall a man called Piers Gaveston to England. 
and some of you have probably heard of, of Piers Gaddesden, I think it would be reasonable to say that he was the great love of Edward II's life. Uh, he was a nobleman uh, from Bayonne, which was the part of southwest France then ruled by England. So he, was a, he wasn't English, but he wasn't really French either. He was a subject of the English crown. Uh, so he was a nobleman, he wasn't lowborn. He had been placed in the future Edward II's household by Edward I uh, as his companion. Uh, Edward fell in love with him. So uh, a few months before he died, Edward I, deeply concerned about this relationship between uh, his son, the future king, and Piers Gaveston, sent Gaveston into exile. Uh, so basically the first thing that Edward II did when he became king was to recall Gaveston. And not only to recall him, uh, he made him Earl of Cornwall and brought him into the royal family by marrying him to his niece, Margaret de Clare. Uh, so as I said, Edward II had a lot of older sisters. He also had a lot of nieces. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret de Clare was the oldest unmarried female member of the English royal family in 1307. So Gaveston was now the king's nephew by marriage uh, and the Earl of Cornwall. And Edward's favouritism towards Piers Gaveston over the next few months um, basically brought England almost to the brink of civil war because his barons were so unhappy at his favouritism and his ignoring his other barons uh, that they armed themselves against the king. And Edward did likewise. And, it, and England for a few weeks really teetered uh, on the brink of civil war. And this was fortunately uh, averted when Edward uh, decided to exile Gaveston but not really exile, uh, he sent him to Ireland uh, to act as his Lord Lieutenant of Ireland there. So he sent him away from the country in great honour. And Gaveston, in fact, did quite a good job as, as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland for, uh, for the next year. So in the meantime, Edward II had, in fact, married. And if he had been born in 1984 rather than 1284, mm -hmm. perhaps he would have married Piers Gaveston. <laughs> but unfortunately, of course, this was not an option 700 years ago. And he married Isabella of France, who I also written a book about. <laughs> uh, she was the daughter of the great uh, French king, Philip IV. So she was, in fact, the niece of Edward's stepmother, which all gets a little bit confusing, all these tangled royal families. So Edward I uh, and Philip IV, their fathers, had gone to war together in the 1290s, which quite often happened between England and France. So this royal marriage between Edward and Isabella was the price of peace, uh, of arranging peace between <coughs> these, these two kingdoms. So neither of them had any choice in the matter. So they married in France in uh, January 1308. Uh, Edward was 23, Isabella was barely 12, which, uh, <coughs> you know, it's from, by our modern standards, is absolutely horrendous. Uh, fortunately, uh, Isabella did not become pregnant for another four years, so I think almost certainly they, they did not consummate their marriage uh, for some years. And Edward showed very little interest in Isabella at the beginning, which I think is partly because he was in love with Gaveston, but also partly because she was, let's face it, 12 years old. So Isabella also appears in the film Braveheart, if you remember that. Uh, she meets, she's a growing woman in the film Braveheart. She meets William Wallace and in, even gets pregnant by him. Uh, but in <coughs> fact, when William Wallace was executed, this was in August 1305, and Isabella then was not even 10 years old. <laughs> so we can absolutely say, we're completely sure that uh, Isabella never met William Wallace and she could only have been pregnant by him if she remained pregnant for about seven and a half years. Um, so ultimately, in fact, Edward and Isabella seemingly had quite a happy marriage, um, although it didn't perhaps begin very well, partly because Isabella was so young. Um, they had four children together. Uh, Edward also had uh, an illegitimate son called Adam, so although he has a reputation as a gay king, and I think he was predominantly a lover of men, he was also capable of sexual relations with, with women. And Edward and Isabella's first child was born on the 13th of November, 1312, so just over 704 years ago. And to the surprise of none of you, I'm sure, he was called Edward. <laughs> <laughs> they were not very creative with names, <laughs> And this was uh, the future King Edward III, who ruled England for 50 years and has a reputation as one of England's uh, greatest kings. Uh, he was born at Windsor Castle when Isabella was probably 17, 
and Edward II was, was 28 by then. But tragedy had struck Edward II some months before this because Piers Gaveston had 